And we now move on to our oral questions and to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. And could I just inform the members that questions 5 and 15 have been withdrawn? And I call Mr. Roy Beggs. Question number one. With your permission, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I'll answer questions number one, three, and eleven at the same time. I'd like to request an additional minute to respond. All HSC trusts have introduced a new home, human resources pay, payroll, travel, and subsistence (HRPTS) over the last year. And whilst the vast majority of payments to HSC staff have been made correctly over this period, unfortunately there have been problems for some staff in receiving the correct pay and expenses particularly in relation to allowances rather than basic pay. In addition, a system issue emerged at the start of the new tax year, which meant that a number of staff had additional national insurance contributions deducted from their pay in error. I am extremely concerned and disappointed about the difficulties that uh, some staff are experiencing in receiving the correct pay. I expect department officials and trust and business services organisation management to work collectively to ensure that all outstanding payments are made quickly and that on a case-by-case -case basis there is urgent consideration given to any losses experienced by staff arising from employer responsibilities. BSO and Trusts have already implemented a range of measures to correct any mistakes. This includes running additional payment cycles to make good any underpayments, and where this is not addressed, the problem, for example, hardship, then emergency payments have also been used. The April pay run was supplemented by an additional payroll cycle with payments reaching uh, staff accounts on the 2nd of May 2014 or 6th of May 2014. There is also a plan in place to fix the issue of incorrect national insurance deductions for future pay runs. Testing of this solution is currently underway, with the aim of implementing it as soon as possible and before the next monthly pay run on the 20th of May. In the meantime, uh, an off-cycle payment run was made to ensure that affected staff had the corrected pay in their bank account by the 6th of May. In addition to this, my department has approved further expert support for the HSC payroll functions over the coming months. This will provide additional resources to help with the familiarisation of the new HRPTS system and will also help staff develop solutions to staff queries. The issue regarding the application of emergency tax codes by the HMRC is not due to the HRPTS system. Notwithstanding this, I have required the HSC to take all necessary steps to resolve this issue for staff. Therefore, the BSO and Trusts are urgently liaising directly with HMRC on behalf of HSC staff to investigate this issue and establish an appropriate resolution to it. The primary focus of both HMRC and HSC is to remedy this position as soon as possible and address the resulting pay issues. Thank you. And I call Mr Roy Beggs for a supplement. We have a very heavily pressed health workforce, some of whom have carried out additional shifts and have not received appropriate pay on a timely basis several months, four or five months after I understand they have carried out that work. Can the Minister explain who is responsible? Who will be picking up the additional costs some of those work staff will have incurred by bank, bank charges because of missed uh, debits? Uh, uh, and how are we going to ensure that this never happens again? Well, uh, in terms of the last part of the question, um, it's 35 years since the last system was introduced, so it will uh, all being well be a very long time before uh, a new system is introduced with the teething problems uh, that this one has caused us uh, in the future. In terms of the, the assistance of staff, uh, it's totally wrong that, that people aren't paid for the work that they've carried out. Let, let's, let's not beat about the bush here. That is wrong and shouldn't be the case. Uh, but mistakes have been made, and uh, there have been issues and problems largely relating to overtime or for people who are putting in travel and subsistence claims and so forth that they are very well entitled to receive but haven't been receiving. Uh, so the system uh, was established um, through the BSO and was put out to the trusts. Uh, the responsibility for the actual um, r running of it uh, is now with the trusts, and, and, and therefore uh, they are the people who, who are. are, are to account um, for what has been happening and what, what has been going on. And it is for the trusts to give every assistance to those members of staff who have uh, found hardship um, as a result of this and to help them deal with those issues, to overcome those issues, which may involve financial support but may involve other kinds of support as well.
Thank you, Ms. Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, uh, Minister, I have to uh, declare an interest. I have one sister who is awaiting a payment of £1,200 and a niece who is awaiting a payment of £700. And we're told only last week it will be the end of this month before they receive their right entitlement. And the Minister is right to point out that people should be paid for the work that they do. And of course, it's not just nurses, it goes across a whole range of health care staff and auxiliary staff. But does the Minister believe that the system is fit for purpose and that the decision to pay off a number of the, the back roll support staff? I skilled payroll staff was the right decision made. I understand that there was a series of tests carried out in the system. It's been installed elsewhere and has worked successfully elsewhere. Uh, so the system should be fit for purpose. And I suppose um, a system is, is as good as what the information that's fed to it. And uh, that appears to be where, where the issues arise, where um, you are getting information which is not regular information, which is irregular information. Um, that has caused the problems, and uh, in some instances it may be in terms of the timing of sheets that have come in, but in many instances it will be the fault um, of the people uh, on the trust side who are actually administering the system, not of the individuals who, who are making the claims um, who should rightly uh, be receiving their money. Uh, Belfast Trust has established a dedicated payroll helpline for queries and is holding drop-in clinics across its sites to ensure that the solutions are agreed quickly. So, there is a, a much greater focus now on, get, on getting this resolved than there has been for some time now. Thank you. And I call Mr. Phil Flanagan. Gormi, I get the, the last question, Kjordi, and I thank the, the Minister for his uh, very detailed answer. Um, but I suppose if, if this was the Ulster Bank doing it, we would all be sitting here going mad. Um, but the, the situation has not been acceptable. Can I ask the Minister if he accepts that it was low paid workers and, and workers on zero hour contracts who were disproportionately affected by this? situation and can he outline to the House how he intends to put the problems faced by those individuals right in the common period? Well, I think it's workers across the range, not just low paid workers. Um, it's people who, who are working overtime, people who are working uh, the unusual hours and so forth um, who have been hit hardest as a result of this. As I indicated, um, the Belfast Trust has had a lot of problems with it. Uh, have the dedicated um, payroll. Other trusts have extended their phone line opening hours um, of their payroll departments because I know that was one of the issues. A lot of people couldn't get through uh, to talk to someone. Um, and uh, payroll departments within trusts have been working hard to ensure that all the staff received their correct pay in a timely manner. So a lot of it has been resolved. I want all of it resolved. Um, so it doesn't matter whether 90 or 95 per cent or 98 per cent are getting it. I want to be 100 per cent of people who are getting the, the, the rightful pay. I have made that very, very clear. That is what needs to happen and what needs to, to be done. Um, and I understand that people are, are, who are in the system are working very, very hard at this point to try to get this resolved because uh, they are all in the, this together in many ways. Uh, the people who, who are, are d delivering the service recognise that it is their work colleagues um, who are losing out and they need to be correctly paid, um, irrespective of the, 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 the code uh, that they are working in or indeed the field that they are working in. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I think whilst we would recognise that trusts are working hard to resolve the issues, it is right, as the Minister has done, to acknowledge that many members of staff have found themselves uh, in hardship as a result. And can the Minister perhaps outline to the House the process for those staff who will be looking to claim for additional payments? Well, pay is adjusted on notifications um, which is received from the line managers. That can be uh, enhanced payments, for example, overtime or on call or on social hours, absences, changes to contracts, and indeed starters or leavers. Generally communicated to the payroll department in the form of timesheets. And these no notifications are not received by agreed deadlines or incorrect errors will be reflected in the payroll. The majority of pay issues experienced by the HSC in the past six months have been related to enhanced or amended pay. And, uh, those are, are, are the sorts of areas that, that, that people um, need to ensure that the forms go in time, the line managers need to ensure that the forms go in time, but then the people who are actually feeding the information into the system um, in the administrative side of it <coughs> also need to ensure that everything is correct. We have had the additional problem of the national insurance uh, being incorrectly applied. That was not um, part of the system's fault. That was an HMRC issue. Uh, so that caused additional stress uh, and, and problems for, for people who had already uh, had less pay than they should have. 
um, and that is something that we're working very closely with the HMRC uh, to have their end of things resolved, um, so that issue can be tidied up quickly as well. Thank you. And I call Mr. Raymond McCartney. Question number two, please. I am supportive of this cross-border initiative and the contribution it can make <coughs> to promoting and taking forward healthcare innovation. In response to a previous question <coughs> on the 19th of March 2013, I said, and again would repeat it, it was important that the initiative is complementary to the broader <coughs> e-health and innovation agendas being taken forward by my department and Invest NI, and I encourage organisations associated with the initiative to become members of the Northern Ireland Connected Health Ecosystem. My officials are exploring with the Western Health and Social Care Trust and other organisations opportunities which could be taken from a Northern Ireland perspective to support the further development of this initiative. It will also be important that organisations associated with the initiative have in place a clear development path and strategy that they work with Invest NI to identify opportunities for potential financial support. Finally, as a cross-border initiative, it will be an important communication also takes place with the Department of Health in the Republic of Ireland. Thank you. Mr. McCartney for a supplement. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I indeed thank the Minister both for his answer and indeed the, the update on this particular project. The Minister is sort of saying about it, you know, the, the process. Has the Minister any sort of indication or any outline plan as to what his department will bring in terms of resources? Well, in terms of connected health, we see it as a, a key and, and strategic area for us to move forward in, and it creates a lot of opportunities uh, for the, the health department uh, to move uh, to, different, uh, to a different, different plane in many senses in, in terms of its delivery of services. Uh, my permanent secretary participated in the launch of the Northwest Health Innovation uh, last May, and officials have been liaising with the Western Health and Social Care Trust the University of Ulster and Invest NI to consider the type of support which might be made uh, available um, to the initiative. Consideration is also being given to the funding of a post for an initial three-month period, subject to review and possible extension for up to an additional 21 months maximum, to help with the securing of funding and to coordinate and progress this initiative. One option which is being explored is to have this post placed within CTRIC. Uh, which uh, the member will know is a unique facility based in the North West promoting and facilitating translational research. Thank you. And I call Mr George Robinson. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister how is your department's memorandum of understanding contributing to innovation in Northern Ireland? Well, <clears throat> We established a memorandum of understanding with Invest NI, which is something that is quite unusual um, on the connected health uh, ecosystem. And, uh, other places are looking at the leadership Northern Ireland is giving on this issue. And that will provide strategic leadership across government in this arena. And, um, we, we have uh, targeted R&D and innovation funding, the development of the Northern Ireland connected health ecosystem, collaboration with other European and North American regions, and the promotion of the Connected Health Agenda internationally. The MOU led to the launch in September 2012 of the Northern Ireland Connected Health Ecosystem, uh, which brings together universities, um, the, the, the health and social care, and indeed the business sector to translate issues and problems into solutions which are then deliverable um, in the marketplace. And the executive's commitment to healthcare innovation is expressed both in its programme for government and its economic strategy. And an innovation strategy is to be published by the executive later this year, which will reinforce this commitment. Thank you. And I call Ms. Anna Lowe. Question number four, please. Thank you. The Eastern Health and Social Care Trust has purchased the former Torbank School site adjacent to the Ulster Hospital. Work is presently ongoing to create a car park that will hold approximately an additional 250 vehicles. It is anticipated that the facility will become operational in August 2014. Thank you. I want to thank the Minister uh, for his answer. But my understanding of the Torbank site car park is only a temporary measure. Uh, once the mental health facility 
um, is, is, is going to be approved and it will take over the Tuabang site. So is that a long-term uh, facility then planned for the Astor Hospital for car parking? Well, certainly um, the Trust is looking at um, how it provides mental health services um, in uh, the, the southeastern area, and it is looking um, at uh, developing uh, mental health services um, at uh, the Ulster Hospital, as opposed to um, Lagan Valley and indeed uh, the Downs. So that's an ongoing issue, um, which hasn't, uh, we haven't got a final paper on yet. So um, that's something. Um, what we look at in the future. In any event, um, what is happening at the Torbank site will give us considerable easement at this point in time um, with the 250 additional places. And it is certainly a major issue at the Ulster Hospital uh, to provide car parking, uh, and it has uh, been something which has been ongoing for a period of time. So we will very much welcome uh, the move to have these places available in August this year. Commissioner Peter Weir. I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can I ask the Minister for his assessment of what factors he believes are contributing to the extra demand for uh, parking on the Ulster uh, site? Well, one of the reasons is that there is ongoing major construction work. <clears throat> we are spending almost £200 million at the Ulster Hospital, um, which will make it a state-of-the-art facility in conjunction with the works that have already happened um, at the intensive care uh, side of the, of, of, of the, of the hospital. Um, we find that most of those attending, either patients or visitors, are doing so using private transport, so we would encourage uh, greater use of public transport. There is an increase in provision of services as a result of reconfiguration and changes to services across the wider uh, uh, health and social care. And uh, also, many of the potential patients are not served by direct public transport to Dundonald, so uh, perhaps that is an issue that Translink could assist us on. Uh, the Department approved the business case uh, for the Trust to purchase the former Torbank School um, and, and were able to acquire it from the Department of Education last year. And work is presently ongoing to, to ensure that we have those spaces available uh, in the summer of this year. Well, Mr. Sam Gardner. Mr. Speaker, may I ask the, the Minister, in relation to the car parking charges at the Ulster Hospital, after you have a the income from the machines for people par parking their cars. What further uh, finance is available as a result of car parking to be put into the Ostler Hospital for its improvements? Well, obviously our, our, our task is first and foremost to provide health care. And uh, people will use um, car parking to, to access that health care, um, as they will use car parking in many other instances to access services that are provided. Um, we, as a, a public body, will pay rates and we'll have to maintain the, those facilities. So having a charge on it enables uh, us to concentrate um, the services or the, the money that we have on, on actually providing services. Um, so obviously it's important that car parks do pay for themselves, uh, and that's uh, something that uh, we are doing. Uh, and it's something that has been given consideration to some of the other hospital sites, and I know that there's a lot of uh, uh, people who, who are perhaps unhappy with that, uh, but we should be very clear that our first fo focus must be on providing services to the public, and car parking spaces is not one of those services as we in the Department of Health um, are there to provide. Um, it is something that should be paying for itself. Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. President, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. And Minister, just following on from your last answers. And given the concerns expressed by unions and about the general public, do you believe the current pricing structures for the car parks in the north is feasible both for the patients and their families? Well, in many instances, the, the, the car parks are, are uh, the charges are, are very low compared to what people are paying uh, for town car parks. Uh, and in terms of people who are long-term ill, uh, the, the trusts generally have. Uh, policies in place which will enable reimbursement, so you're not punishing people um, who have people who are, are very uh, Ill, Ill or unwell. Um, so uh, I think the car parking charges have sought to be fair and, and reasonable and measured, and uh, we certainly can respond whether we're identifying uh, or anybody identifies uh, that there are people uh, being overcharged. Um, that is something that we'd be very happy to look up. 
you, and I call Mr. Paul Gervin. Principal Deputy Speaker, ask the Minister question number six. My department has supported and taken forward the necessary legislation to enable this to happen in line with the rest of the UK and continues to do so. Non-medical prescribing is an important part of my department's commitment to modernise health and social care. Such developments enable new roles and new ways of working to improve the quality of services and deliver safe, effective services which are focused on patient experience. This makes it easier for patients to get access to the medicines that they need. Changes made to date have enabled nurses, pharmacists and optometrists to train as independent prescribers and have enabled physiotherapists, podiatrists and radiographers to train as supplementary prescribers. Nurses working in the community may train as community practitioner prescribers and further changes are in hand which will permit physiotherapists and podiatrists to train as independent prescribers. Thank you, Mr. Gervin, for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Uh, and in doing so, I just would like to ask the Minister what would the benefits of non medical uh, prescribers be to the system? And I just want to use one typical example of what has happened this week, where one gentleman I did speak to several months ago was put into hospital where he was on 22, a regime of 22 or 23 tablets per day. And after speaking with uh, the pharmacist in the hospital, it was reduced down to four tablets per day, which is a dramatic uh, help. And he said he had never felt better uh, in many years uh, because some of the medication he was on, he should only be on a short time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Principal. And it's important that people do receive the appropriate medication, and it's important that patient safety isn't compromised in all of this. Um, and we believe that through using um, a range of prescribers that we can improve that patient care without compromising patient safety. It will make the process easier and quicker for patients to receive the appropriate medicines. It will increase patients' choice in accessing medicines, make better use of the skills of our health professionals, which is very important, and contribute to the introduction of more flexible working uh, across the health service. Where we would see it happening um, most would be in the management of long-term conditions, uh, the medicines management and medication review, emergency urgent care, unscheduled care, mental health services and services for non-registered patients, for example, the homeless and indeed um, palliative cares. And uh, that's, there's a, a range of people who can provide that. We're looking at uh, pl or there's plans nationally to extend supplementary prescribing to dietitians and orthoptists and independent prescribing to radiographers and paramedics in the future, and that's something that we look at as well. Thank you, Mr. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the, the Minister? And can I ask the Minister whether or not all of the individual health trusts here are fully complying with the HSE Northern Ireland formulary on the distribution of drugs? Well, that's something that we uh, have been ruling out in very recent days, and uh, it is something that all of our trusts will be um, supporting and uh, developing and, and working with. And uh, the formulary is a great opportunity to move forward in terms of um, our drugs management and prescribing, uh, which of course is a, a key uh, area of importance for us. Call Ms. Katrina Ruan. Question number seven. A public consultation by the Health and Social Care Board on the future model for Tier 4 inpatient addiction services closed in January 2014. Uh, the Board has taken due consideration of the full range of issues raised as part of the consultation before bringing forward final proposals on appropriate models for future service provision, which seeks to improve outcomes for clients and which covers the wider needs of the overall Northern Ireland population. The Board anticipates that it will be in a position to announce the outcomes of this work before the end of June 2014. Ms. Rianne and given the increasing levels of addiction across the island, can the Minister outline the discussions that he's having with his Dublin counterpart in developing an island-wide strategy in relation to addiction? Well, in terms of uh, alcohol, um, we have been working quite closely. Um, with our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland um, on this issue. And indeed, uh, we held a, a conference um, last year, uh, an all island conference um, on addictions. And uh, that is something that we would regularly um, discuss at our North South ministerial meetings. So, this is an area which we would see uh, as having priority. 
And one of the things that we are jointly looking at uh, well, and independently looking at as well um, is uh, the issue of minimum pricing of alcohol. And uh, it is certainly something which will work much better if it's introduced in both ju jurisdictions, uh, certainly if not simultaneously, uh, as close to each other uh, as possible. Excess alcohol com consumption costs Northern Ireland around £900 million pounds each year. And uh, that is certainly something which we need to be very aware of. In 2012, provisional figures showed that around 270 people died directly as a result of alcohol misuse, which is an increase of 28 or 11 per cent for the figures in 2011. And overall, the numbers of deaths have increased since 2001, when we had 206 deaths by around 30 per cent. William Humphrey. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can I ask the Minister, what role does the community and voluntary sector currently play in this field in Northern Ireland? Well, the community and, and voluntary sector uh, make an invaluable contribution to our efforts on address on alcohol and, and drugs misuse. The recent consultation by um, Health and Social Care Board rightly reflected this and sought to build in their role in preventing and treating harm and supporting recovery. The evidence shows that rehab can be undertaken as effectively in this sector and is already happening through existing contracts with, for example, Northlands in Lutonderry and Carlisle House um, uh, in, in, in Belfast. And there may be an opportunity for other potential providers to also bid to provide these services in due course. It should be noted that in using the third sector as key partners, it's not about privatising alcohol and, and drug treatment services. It's about making best use of people who are out there at the cool face uh, and who have uh, great knowledge locally of, of circumstances. Uh, I know that FASA as an organisation in its own constituency uh, is, is doing uh, terrific work and actually had the privilege of uh, meeting people who are raising awareness of drug and alcohol problems who are walking Northern Ireland. So I, I met them on Saturday night uh, when they made it to Lisbon after walking 27 miles um, from Bangor. And uh, they're doing really good, good, good work in, in raising awareness of, of alcohol uh, and drugs issues. Mr. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister uh, for his answer and fully appreciate uh, the tremendous task it is to address the problems of drug and alcohol addiction. I'm sure the Minister will agree with me that schools could play a very large part and perhaps do. Can the Minister tell me? What partnerships, what strategies are in place involving education and his department to address this problem before people become addicts and it's perhaps in many cases too late? Well, uh, Minister Dowd and myself have had discussions uh, on these issues. Aside from that, um, we have a, a public health working group, a um, ministerial working group, uh, which education uh, contributes very uh, valuably to. And uh, consequently, there is pieces of work that is being carried out uh, in conjunction with a range of departments, including education, uh, to get messages out there. Uh, I think one of the challenges that we do need to recognise is that all of us people who are a bit older uh, appear to be a bit more sensible, too sensible, very often uh, it's kind of challenging to get messages across to young people. And when you're up against um, I suppose the soaps on television um, and a lot of the messages that are coming out on, on DVDs and videos and indeed people who young people look to as role models, you know, the pop stars, the, the football stars and others. And when the messages that they get from those people is that it's really cool to get drunk, it's kind of challenging for us people who are, are a little grey headed to, to, to encourage young people not to participate. So you know, there's a lot of work happening here. Uh, and I, I think that we need to have more role models for young people who are doing things in a positive way. Um, I was at a couple of recent events um, where Ulster rugby players were, were putting out really, really positive messages, and that's good. Um, we need more of our, our, our people who people look to, our stars, um, to actually make that impression on young people. Ms. Bronwyn McGahan. Can we all get question eight? The non-admission policy currently in place in a number of health and social care trusts is presently being reviewed by the Health and Social Care Board. The Board is also in the process of analysing responses to the recent consultation document, making choices, 
Meeting the current and future needs of older people, I will consider the Board's review of admission policies alongside the final consultation report when I receive it in the early summer. And that ends the other uh, period for oral questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Ms. Megan Ferrum. Um, for your last can, Corla, um, can I ask the Minister what steps he has taken, if any, to ensure that social services support and assistance is provided to the families um, of the recent racist attacks carried out by the UVF in Belfast? Well, in all of this, um, people who, who need, need uh, help from social services will, will, will find that, that they will get it. Um, so if people are approaching social services uh, or indeed are, are being passed to social services um, from PSNI or, or indeed others, um, that is something that we would uh, be following uh, up on. Uh, I think it's absolutely appalling that we do have racist attacks uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, thankfully, the numbers are quite small, and I think it would be wholly appropriate um, that in cases where support is required that we provide um, that support for those individuals. Fair and for supplement. I would like to thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can I ask, does he agree that um, maybe the, support, the support provided by social services needs to be more targeted where there are instances like this? And has he been in contact to ensure, to ensure that this support will be continued? I can assure the member that you know, social services don't need to go looking for work because it comes, it comes to them. And we have many issues and many problems and very, very um, stressed situations. I had the privilege yesterday of meeting and being with the, the Northern Ireland Association of Social Workers whenever they uh, launched their, 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 their blueprint, or launched their blueprint. And one of the things that they are looking at is how they can actually have less um, documentation and paperwork uh, to actually carry out to enable them to have more time to actually carry out the, 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 the job in hand, which is actually responding uh, to people's needs. And uh, that is a key area that we need to continue to work on to, to make social worker more flexible um, and to be able to be more responsive um, to all of the needs um, and to uh, be able to manage caseloads in, uh, in a more efficient way uh, and have less uh, time to be spent behind desks. I call Ms. Michaela Boyle. Good morning. Um, given the recent statistics, uh, Minister shown that seven people have died of hunger uh, in hospitals since 2008. Uh, what are you doing to examine and remedy this extremely uh, serious issue? Good morning. Well, I'm aware of recent media reports in respect of official statistics which show malnutrition as a cause of death in relation to seven people between 2008 and 2012. I'm, however, not aware of any evidence that this malnutrition occurred during a stay in hospital. That would be totally unacceptable if that was the case. I have also been advised that the Health and Social Care Board has not received any serious adverse incident reports in respect of this. However, my department has contacted the relevant Health and Care Trust and asked that they carry out a check of the medical records of the deceased patients to identify if malnutrition was related in any way to their stay in hospital. I understand that this will take a number of days to complete as medical records have been stored off-site, and it would be inappropriate for me to be saying anything further um, at this time. And I call Ms. Boyd for supplement. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer? Uh, Minister, disturbingly, um, five of these hospital deaths have been elderly people over the age of 65 and have been reported as being as a result of malnutrition as reported. Uh, do you believe it is a damning indictment on how under pressure nursing staff uh, is on, in our hospitals? Gormagat. Well, first of all, I think I said at the, the start, and, and the member doesn't appear to have listened, um, that I'm not aware of evidence that this malnutrition um, actually occurred during a stay in hospital. So let's not be, be um, associating people's deaths, which you can't get anything more serious with. Um, with a, a, an area where we haven't got the evidence to support that. That's very important at, at the outset. In all of these things, um, good nutrition is something which is vitally important. Um, and we have been promoting a good nutrition strategy, which was launched by my department in 2011, which aims to improve the quality of nutritional care of adults in Northern Ireland um, through the prevention, identification and management of malnutrition in all health and social care settings, 
including people's own homes, because very often older people can suffer from malnutrition in their own homes, they can suffer from dehydration in their own homes. We need to be responsive to those issues, to be identifying those issues at an early point and having them addressed at an early point. Thank you. And I call Mr. David McNary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister Ed Miliband has promised a 48-hour time gap to see a GP. Can you make a similar promise here in Northern Ireland? I'm, I'm flattered that the, 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 the member um, thinks Ed Miliband's promises um, will be met. That, that, that's, that's a new one, and I'm sure Nigel Farage will be very pleased to, to learn that his members have such confidence uh, in Ed Miliband uh, to deliver. <laughs> in terms of seeing GPs, people who urgently require CGPs should be seeing them within 48 hours. Now, that doesn't mean that every single person who wants to see a GP either needs to see a GP within 48 hours or should see a GP within 48 hours. We are getting more and more people seeing our GPs, and consequently the workload for our GPs is, is something which is growing. And we need to identify how we can best meet the public need in that respect so that they receive, see the appropriate person and get the appropriate care to meet their needs. Okay, and Mr. McNary, for a supplement. Thank you. I, I can't resist uh, just passing a, an invitation to the Minister. Nigel Farage is in Belfast tomorrow, and uh, I hear he's inviting many people for a pint, so you're very, very uh, welcome. And, uh, uh, to come along to, to Belfast for that, and I'll pass on your best wishes to him at the same time if you're unable to make it. Uh, but, but on a more serious uh, vein, uh, Minister, would you be able to uh, assist? I know you said what should be, what will be, and what, should, what might be. What are uh, the average times to see uh, and fulfill GP uh, appointments? And uh, if necessary, what is necessary to be done to improve uh, those waiting times? Well, in terms of our, our GP practices, which are independent health providers, I might add, um, in terms of the practices, um, they have uh, their own protocols in place uh, in terms of delivery. And there is an expectation from, from the, the department um, that those people who are providing that service, uh, that they actually do provide services in a timely manner. And one of the things is urgent care. So if you need to urgently see a doctor, um, that you are able to urgently see a doctor, and those are, that is generally uh, taken within 24 or 48 hours. And I know that doctors keep every 48 hours ahead. They keep slots available. And whilst they cannot always see everybody within the 48 hours who are urgent, um, they more often than not actually are, are able to, to see the people within that period of time. Um, although there may be some slippage on occasions. Thank you. I call Kelly. <clears throat> Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, hopefully you'll be aware of an adverse incident, if you could call it that, in Craigavon Area Hospital on the 26th of April, when raw sewage spilled out of the pipes and the cubicles onto side wards in uh, one north, and staff had to spend seven hours cleaning up the mess while patients wore uh, masks. And does the Minister accept that the morale of the health service is so low that nurses are now being balloted, are considering balloting for strike action in the next few weeks? And what is the minister going to do to restore morale and confidence in the health service? Well, I'm not sure that um, the, the first incident led to a ballot for, for strike action, um, albeit an appalling incident, an incident that shouldn't have happened, and uh, one that, that um, health estates and, and indeed the health estates within the trust area uh, need to ensure doesn't happen. Um, in terms of uh, morale within the health service, we have taken on more nurses, we have taken on more doctors, we have taken on more allied health professionals, and we recognise that the workloads are extremely high, uh, but nonetheless uh, we will have to ensure that we meet the needs of the public, because we are servants of the public, um, as are the staff within the health and social care system, servants of the public. And that's why we are employing and investing more in frontline services. Uh, to ensure that we do have the appropriate numbers, which isn't always the case, and sometimes takes time to, to fill positions and ensure 
uh, that those positions can be filled when somebody else moves on or, or falls ill um, or for whatever reason um, has to, to move on from a particular position. Kelly for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, be aware of the recent guidelines I think from uh, NICE and, and GB in relation to the number of nurses per, uh, per patient. Uh, what are your targets and our aspirations in relation to the, the same? Well, we seek to fulfil um, what, what, what NICE is recommending on, on these issues. Uh, in many areas of, of hospital, you'll actually find that uh, the, numbers, uh, the ratios are actually much higher in terms of, of nurses um, to patients. Uh, it depends on the in, intensity of, of treatment that is required. Uh, but certainly we will be paying very close attention to NICE recommendations um, in relation to ratios. Uh, and seeking um, to fulfil them. Uh, in terms of our, our nursing staff, uh, the qualified whole time equivalent um, has went up uh, from 2011, September 2011 to December 2013 by 640, which is a, an increase of 4.7%. And in terms of nursing support, the whole time equivalent is up by 142. Uh, which is a 3.7 per cent increase. So we're not cutting nurses' jobs. We're employing more of them. We're employing more doctors. We're not cutting doctors. We're employing more allied health professionals. We are investing more of the money and more of our budget into frontline services. And if the member uh, was happy to actually uh, allow us to spend more money on health as opposed to welfare reform, I might have 70 million extra to be able to spend next year. What the member doesn't want to come to the Department of Health. What the member doesn't want to come to the Department of Health. She wants to starve the Department of Health of funding. The party opposite wants to starve the Department of Health of funding. We can have a further 70 million pounds taken out of our budget to spend on welfare reform, which has already been taken from the budget or we can invest it in health. The members opposite don't want to invest in health. Thank you. Order. Ms. Katrina Ruan. Gurra Margaret, a brief last can call you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. You can see what the ministers are trying to deflect from the fact that there's serious problems in the health service and grandstanding will not do him any good. And I wonder, could the minister give me an update on the situation over the past few weeks in the Royal uh, the emergency department of the Roy. Well, in terms of uh, the emergency department um, in the Royal Victoria Hospital, it always faces its challenges, it always faces spikes, uh, but is dealing uh, with issues as and when they, they come their way. So we haven't um, been, been having um, as many difficulties uh, in recent weeks in the Royal. Uh, there was uh, an occasion uh, uh, very recently uh, where 15 nurses come in um, because there was a large spike after the May Day holidays. That's not something which was wholly unexpected. Uh, but the member can, can seek to deflect from, from the facts that she wants to starve the health service of money. She wants to take £70 million from the health service next year, all she likes, but that's a fact. And if she doesn't want that money spent in the NE, why is she asking questions about it? She wants to spend it elsewhere. For I'd love to be able to thank the Minister for the answer, but that certainly wasn't an answer. Um, in fact, I got no answer there to my question. And staff and unions have indicated that on Tuesday at 9 o'clock there were 100 patients in the emergency department, there were 20 trolley waits, one person waiting over 11 hours. Can the Minister confirm that this was the case? How will it be addressed? And please, in your answer, can, don't be using excuses and grandstanding. Well, in case the member didn't, didn't hear the first time, it was resolved. It's not how we're going to resolve it. It was resolved. There was 15 additional nurses come in and resolved the issue. So uh, whenever we're looking at, uh, she was referred to 11 hours, in terms of 12-hour waits, we have absolutely slashed the numbers of people who have been waiting for more than 12 hours from what it was three, four, five years ago. There's been tremendous progress made there. And people will use extensively um, the, the, the health service and they will use extensively um, our emergency departments. And it's important that we can respond to those people. And yes, starving the Department of Health and consequently the trusts 
of the resources that they need by £70 million next year will have an impact on emergency departments and every other aspect of the health service. Order, and that brings an end to question time. Uh, the House will just take its ease while we change the top table. To apologise to, um, to your office for not being in my place for question 12 um, for the Dell Minister, Minister Farry, last Tuesday. Um, I was caught out and actually thought I'd got in time, but hadn't. I did previously, um, on the same day, go to the Speaker's office and make that apology, but I wanted to do it from the House of the Assembly today. And uh, I thank you for having that courtesy indeed. Point of order. Uh, point of order, uh, for your last question, I'm just wondering which clock you go on to, to judge the times, because we have a different time on this clock and a different one on this time and a different one on this clock, so it's hard for us to know when question time is coming to an end. And I'm sure the member knows that it's up to me to decide which clock I'm using, and you're not challenging the chair.